Young people's experiences, ideas, choices, and preferences help shape the future of cities. This episode of the Bright Young Minds show on Future Cities Africa is with Paulina Mamukhobo, Director for Trade and Investment Promotion at the KZN Department of Economic Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs. Paulina, welcome. It's lovely to have you on the show. Can you give us a brief introduction to your role at the department? Thanks, Dan. I'm a Director of Trade and Investment Promotions at the Department of Economic Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs. So just to sum it up, I'm responsible for um, trade promotion, trade development in the province, the promotion thereof, the attraction of investment into the province, and the promotion of investment in the province. So when I talk about um, investment promotion and attraction, I'm talking about both domestic investment and foreign direct investment. And I work across multiple sectors. To summarize them, it's mainly the manufacturing sector and the services sector. So manufacturing because of our resource endowment, we'd look at agriculture and agro-processing. We'd look at automotives because we've got quite a number of OEMs um, locating in the province. And we've got also manufacturers of components that feed into the, those value chains. We've got industry, special economic zones that we promote as well to attract manufacturing there, leveraging on our resource endowment and to use our strategic location to be able to access markets for um, the uptake of the products that are manufactured and produced locally as well. So with the services sector, we've got um, we've recently held the Durban International Film Festival. So film is quite a significant um, services sector. We've got the global shared services where we've got quite a number of call centers because that's what they are um, commonly known as. We call them EPO centers that are located within the Umshanga region. So across the vast portfolio, which I could name quite a number of other um, sectors as well, the creative arts, uh, September, we're looking at the music in Bezo. So um, just to be broad, KZN is quite diverse with possibility and resource endowments. So when we talk about manufacturing and services, we cut across all those different sectors. And my responsibility is to ensure the development of them, the capacitation of them, and to be able to create forward linkages, which are market opportunities, so that the companies are competitive both locally and internationally, obviously with the responsibility to respond to the challenges of um, employment creation, skills transfer, technology transfer, and of course with that resulting in the reduction of poverty and creating more opportunities for the citizens of the province. What are some of the major challenges that you face in the work that you do and in the sectors that you operate in? And how are these challenges being addressed? I'll start on the micro space, which is my, mainly in my work. Um, it's mainly capacity. So if you look at the province of KZN, it's quite massive. The landscape thereof, we've got 11 districts. All of them have their unique offering, their unique comparative and competitive advantages. So the biggest challenge is capacity in a sense that to cover the lengths and breadths of the province to ensure that inclusive participation becomes a major challenge. So we try to respond to that challenge by collaborating with a lot of um, industry stakeholders, meaning we would work with our local municipalities, we would work with our economic development agencies, which are located within the district, uh, different districts, to be able to reach out to companies in those regions, to give them an opportunity to also know about what is on offer, to also understand what is it that they have capabilities um, of, that is the manufacturing that they do, the type of products, the competitiveness that they have in those regions, how can we best support those so that we bring them to mainstream economy. I'm saying this because most of the time when people think of KZN, they think of Etegini and you can't blame them because that's where everybody comes for holiday and tourism. But there's just so much that the province also has to offer. So the biggest challenge is being able to reach those, but we constantly create those stakeholder partnerships. So we, we lead the stakeholder um, engagements so that we coordinate the efforts of the different role players to be able to reach our people. We also have strategic interventions in the same light, which are, for example, the KZN Growth Coalition, which is led at premier level to be able to rope in together government and business. Um, we call them aid to site engagements, which we meet um, within the different districts, whereby 
the conversation is around what challenges are businesses facing in those regions and what can government do to be able to provide support. For example, if there's unrest, how do we bring in other stakeholders to be able to address those challenges so that businesses are retained and they are not hampered um, from doing their everyday activities? Other challenges that we face is budget constraints, and I think that's a nationwide problem because as much as we do identify the gaps in the different sectors, truth is resources are always limited. So to respond to that challenge, it's important that we collaborate with business, like I mentioned, um, other entities such as the Chambers of Commerce, the different development agencies as well, to say, what programs do you have in place? How do we coordinate that? so that there's no duplication or overlap, but that we coordinate our approaches and we can actually um, quantify and measure the support that we have offered to our entities locally. So it is that those constant challenges, but we have also embarked on um, an intervention, which is the KZN Economic Council, which is similar to NEDLAC. So that brings in social partners such as government, business, civil society, and labor, just to broaden views as well, so that we have sufficient representation, so that when we attend to the challenges that are affecting our businesses and um, our communities, we have equal participation of voices there and we can coordinate efforts, agree on interventions, and actually plan out the rollout of those interventions, making sure that we are all in the same page and we are able to leverage on each other's strengths as well. So those are some of the challenges that particularly in my uh, work I am faced with. And of course, if I can just highlight, we've had the recent triple challenges, as we call them. We had COVID-19, we had the July unrest, we had the recent floods. So those are constant challenges that we're trying to navigate with through rather. So we are working with our international partners. We have uh, organizations such as the United Nations that we are trying to bring on board to say, how do we best direct resources to respond to these challenges, which we are not planned for, but unfortunately we have to respond to them if we are going to ensure business continuity. So this just at a high level, some of the challenges, and of course there's a lot of operational challenges that may be on ground level, but if we are able to have those structures at the top, then we are able to cascade the support and interventions to ground level. Paulina, I'd love to know, what is your approach to problem solving in your professional life? And how do you prioritize what is most important? The different approaches or systems or principles that we pick up in our careers and even in academia sort of shape the way we approach challenges. So for me, it's always defining the problem. What is it that's the main challenge that I'm trying to address in my, uh, in my life? and is it a personal challenge or is it a challenge because it is viewed by society as a challenge? So always to try to hone down and to clearly define what it is that one is actually dealing with. Asking the right questions um, as well, meaning that if you are, if I'm going to step out and seek for help, do I know what type of help it is that I'm searching for? If I'm looking for mentorship to be able to grow, in a particular space um, because of a particular challenge that I'm facing? Am I asking the right questions? Am I identifying the right sources of help as well? Keeping an open mind when you're looking at the different approaches of um, problem solving, because sometimes we come, we approach situations obviously with what our frame of reference. We always try and apply what has worked before, but we're living in quite a world of filled with complexities and it needs an open mind to be able to explore different avenues because some approaches may not work just because they worked previously or they work in a particular setting does not mean that they would work now so another thing that I do personally for myself is creating my own board of directors <laughs> I call them a personal board of directors meaning there's always individuals that I know I can I've identified them based on how I've observed them navigate through life, be it it's in a particular uh, business uh, space or in a career or in a course or even in general um, everyday life. 
to keep bouncing ideas with those people, allow them to give me feedback, which has not been my favorite, but also get another person to help me digest feedback. Because sometimes you can be facing a particular challenge, seek for help, and you don't always get the response that you're hoping for. But you take that feedback and you always find another, what I would call board member, <laughs> to help you digest that feedback and perhaps break it down for you on how you can approach in solving a particular problem. So that's my particular philo philosophy in life in terms of problem solving. And if I was to give advice to myself stepping out of um, my current body and uh, with regards to problem solving, I would say do not isolate yourself because we are more alike than we are different. So the challenges that we face, somebody has faced it before. And um, if you are able to create that network, that cohort, on how to have a particular approach to program, uh, problem solving, you're able to get gather insight, but also don't forget to establish your own voice. Having gathered all the advice, who are you? What do you stand for? What is your value system? That helps you narrow down and filter down or funnel through the advice to be able to take a particular decision. So that's just at a high level, my approach to problem solving. A board of directors to help solve challenges. I'm borrowing that idea, thanks. You're an avid learner. What is your approach to continuous learning and what habits do you need to formulate to stay on top of new trends and emerging developments? Yeah, I'm an avid learner. Others have called me a serial studier, <laughs> which I have come to accept the term. But my general philosophy in life is there is no end to learning. There's always something that you do not know. And the more you learn, the more you realize how much you do not know. The importance of continuous learning is we live in a world, especially in the current era, where things are constantly changing, things are constantly evolving. And if you are going to stay relevant, you need to be able to keep tabs with what's going on. My approach to continuous learning in that regard is I usually identify mentors. I usually identify people I look up to that are in the stream or along the path which I want to take. Because then through them, I sort of look at what is it that they are currently looking at now? What is it that they talk about as future areas of potential development? Because some of them can, could only go so far, but they do realize that with the evolving and changing world, there are so many other opportunities that we as young people, if we could plug ourselves into them, then we are more likely to lead better and to be better um, for what the future needs. So in that regard, then I look at their profile. So I Google a lot of people <laughs> just to try and check what is it that they are learning? What type of conversations are they plugging in? And then that for me guides me into what's my next move. Fortunately, I have a curious brain as well. So whatsoever that um, intrigues me, I don't just read a line about it, but my curiosity drives me to further develop myself. Truth be told, sometimes as you go along the way, studying, especially if you're doing certificate programs or even degrees, you don't necessarily have the full picture of where it will lend you. But I always say to people that it's, the, it's always the thing that leads to the thing. I've always followed that approach. If I'm in the economics field, I'll do development economics. I will do um, the statistical models and the different but to try and create a broader scope so that I know the lengths and breadths of a field. And then I somehow that enables you to carve out a path for further development. So if, for example, I did economics undergrad and then went into the development economic space, local economic development, while you're there, you realize that there's a continental perspective, which leads to more continent-specific development economics. So now you start studying issues around international trade and the legalities of the field as well. And then you realize that there's something new um, that uh, countries are being operated like businesses all of a sudden. So can a country be treated as a corporation? Then you go into the business administration side of stuff. So it is when you land at a particular spot, it opens your mind to the next big thing. So that's my philosophy because somehow, interestingly, it has always aligned with my career development as well. So when I'm called for an interview or apply for positions, even if I don't have the full expertise of the, of, of the requirements of a role, 
I know I'm able to be relevant in conversation and I can actually articulate and be able to add value. And when I plug, I'm plugged into that particular role, then it opens a room for further development as well. So that's my personal approach. I also take on the approach that never let go of an opportunity. And if I can share on this platform, I've never had to pay for my studies from undergrad till, and I'm busy with my PhD now, because I've been intentional about plugging myself out there. If I'm doing my honors already, I'm preparing myself. If I want to do master's, which institutions are there? What bursaries are there? Which bursary will lead me to which platform? When I'm about to complete my master's, I'm already thinking of PhD. People are asking me, what am I going to be doing after my PhD? I'm already thinking of commercial law. So that's my approach to, to learning. And it's not just a collection of certificates, but it's more a collection of learning so, as, so that we are able to remain relevant and be able to add value in the spaces that we are at. Perhaps if I can add also on this, I'm a government official. And I think a lot of times people argue that we usually think within or operate within a particular framework. But it is this process of continuous development that actually opens your mind broader and wider so that be it you'll be working on policy development or incentives development, you are able to develop them knowing, having thought wide and to narrow it enough to the practicalities of the space within which you are meant to add value. So it's something that I'll always vouch for and encourage young people to do because otherwise you're constantly locked in a particular way of thinking and they, your value add is not visible because you're just operating to tick the box of a performance agreement. So if you think broad and wide, in future you will occupy a senior position and you're able to influence from that learning because you've been influenced by a broader world and you're able to contextualize it to the problems that you're meant to solve. This is great insights for anyone. Having curiosity is such a critical part of life. And I do feel that as many people get older, they do lose some of that curiosity. And I think it's critical to try and find that again. How is a young African living in South Africa? Are you currently making sense of what's going on in the world? And how do you keep sane? One thing I've, I've been intentional about, and I know a lot of people would say, don't tune into the news because it's always reporting bad news because bad news sells. But I personally always say you need to be aware of what's happening because it helps you navigate as well your sense-making of the world. Generally, I'm an optimist. So amidst of all that's going on, I believe in a silver lining. Um, amidst of a dark cloud, there's always a silver lining. I look at the young people that are coming up now, um, people like ourselves that we're talking on the platform, to say there's so much hope. There's so much hope that's burning within them. And I sort of leverage on that light. And that's what keeps me going. Because if I was to look at what's gone past and what's currently happening now, it's easy to lose hope and to think maybe I'll leave the country and go live elsewhere. But like it's being said, the grass is not always green on the other side. I talk to other international counterparts. They'll tell you how they wish they could come back to South Africa because um, here you can eat a piece of steak every day. There sometimes they have to wait till December or Christmas time to have a piece of steak. And you realize how privileged you are. Also, having had the privilege of um, traveling the world, I think I've been to all continents. I realized that home is always home. We've got so much that we sometimes overlook because media portrays a picture that it's better out there. So how I keep saying is I keep that positive spirit to say I can make a difference. If I'm making that little bit of a shift in my community, another young person is making that shift as well in their community. Recently, I was awarded the Mail and Guardian um, 200 Young South Africans for government and politics. And I looked at the other 200 young South Africans there having conversations with them in the networking platforms. And I realized there's so much hope. So how I keep saying is to say, although things may seem to be falling apart now, there is hope. There's a philosophy or a concept that says with every involution, there is a restoration. So sometimes it calls for things to turn out to be bad so that people make that mental shift to say, we've got to get up and make a difference. Because sometimes when things are going smooth or everything is an equilibrium, people think things to just remain that way. But it causes a shift. It causes some deterioration of leadership 
for people to, us young people, to introspect and say, would I submit to this type of leadership? What am I doing to ensure that when I'm in a particular role of function, I'm able to lead better so that we are able to see what we would call in the social uh, political world, emancipation of our people. So I think uh, for me, I really keep a positive light to say there's so much hope. Young people are doing incredible things um, in their careers, in their businesses. So to keep saying, I say, yes, a lot of things are falling apart, but with every involution, there's an opportunity for restoration. So if we keep the positive light, then our lives gravitate in that direction, including in the efforts that we make to ensure that we have a better future. So to ensure that we do have a better future, what is your vision for the future of cities? What's standing in the way of this vision and how do you think these challenges can be overcome? Central to my vision is um, decentralization of economic development. I think um, our major cities, especially in provinces such as Gauteng, KZN and Western Cape, have been, um, development has been centered around the economic hubs, which would be Johannesburg, maybe Pretoria and Gauteng, then there would be Durban and KZN, there would be Cape Town. But decentralization in a sense that there's so much innovation that is happening in the peripheral areas of these big cities. And I think our policies and strategies need to start being very intentional to make sure that there is inclusive participation or mainstream participation, even in those modes. Not suggesting that we should draw out everyone from the rural communities to say, come and live in the city, but to try and say, how do we ensure that they are able to have the same opportunity and sense of development in those spaces? Because that's the only way that we will ensure inclusion. And we will expose our people to more opportunities. Because what happens is if a young child living in a shack is able to see or feel a sense of development closer to them, they are able to dream bigger. And what they build will actually even widen the opportunities to others that are still feel that they've been sidelined or sort of um, um, disadvantaged from those mainstream opportunities. So for me, the vision for future cities is definitely that to say, how do we ensure that we decentralize economic um, development? So the different interventions, conferences, in initiatives that we usually have in the big cities, let's carry them and take them to um, the smaller sub-cities, peripheral areas, so that we also bring in the people in those areas to participate, allow them to give of themselves as well, so that we don't impose an urban approach to them but to allow them to infuse their indigenous nature in the innovation of making it smarter future, uh, future cities. Because there's always creativity embedded in what we may call traditional or con conventional. So if we are able to bring those opportunities closer to them, then we infuse a much more ripple effect and everybody then gets taken in the wave of development and growth of our future cities. Paulina, in closing, what advice do you have for young Africans to remain hopeful of the future? The one notion that I subscribe to is, I highlighted it earlier in our conversation to say, the greatest journey one can ever embark on is a journey that leads you safely to yourself. And with that, I, I always say, it's important for us young people to discover who we are and what we are here for. Um, there's a unique offering, a unique gifting, a unique purpose that each one of us is endowed with. So as a young person, you need to be able to have that relationship with yourself to discover what is it that I offer uniquely? What is it that I'm able to do so excellently without imitating another person? And in that, believe in yourself. Um, I think most of the time, because we try to be what others are, we usually compete at their level or with, in their energy frequency and we fail at it. But if you discover this is who I am, this is what I have to offer, refine and work on that, believe in yourself and exert it out there, definitely you are able to add greater value and make a difference in the society where you are. I think the future needs people that will say, I'm here to make a difference because once you have that view and philosophy, then you know it's not just about you, but your impact will touch your lives, the lives of your family, those around you, and even impact the globe at large. People that have made a difference at the world, in the world at large, they haven't been afraid to stay unique and focused on their cause. So as a young person, discover that, 
enjoy that, delight yourself in being the best version of yourself. Believe in yourself and continue to give off that best version and truest version of yourself. A big thank you to Paulina Mamukobo for this insightful conversation on the Bright Young Minds show on Future Cities Africa. Youth is the future of African cities. 